All right, let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, please. This is a, as I've explained to you already, a study of the Paul's letter to the Corinthians, first letter. And as I mentioned each week, uh, perhaps we have some who are visitors or some who are just coming into the class for the first time. We're not taking it line by line, but rather a variety of subjects that we're studying in this particular book. Glad to have everybody in class. Glad to have those uh, folks who uh, join us on uh, live stream at home on their computers. You know, one of the most uh, precious blessings connected with living in this particular nation is the personal freedom that we enjoy. We often, in our prayers, uh, are thankful for those who serve in public security, in the military, so on and so forth, those who protect and guarantee our freedom. Uh, and it's a very important protection, a very important gift that we have in this nation. We pride ourselves on this aspect of our lives and also we measure our success and our worth actually by the amount of freedom that we have. You know, the degree of freedom that we have often is an indicator of how successful we are in society. Uh, the desire for greater personal freedom, you know, to do what we want, when we want to do it, uh, drives the engine of our careers and is, you know, it's a lifelong objective of many people. People save up their money and you know, put away money and invest and work hard and double overtime and so on and so forth. So they'll have enough money to be able to just say, you know, all right, I'm free, I'm independent. I don't have a boss anymore, I can just do what I want. People love this idea of freedom, to be free to do what I want, where I want, whenever I want. Some people work themselves to death, you know, to just to achieve this kind of, this kind of freedom. Um, Roy, somebody brought back some things and we have some more people that came in in the back. If you don't have a sheet, by the way, just put your hand up and Roy will get those to you. Now it's interesting to compare this approach that we have in our country with the view of freedom uh, with what Paul the Apostle says about freedom in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and 10. Very interesting to compare the two. Paul pursued freedom, but his approach was to pursue freedom through slavery. Freedom through slavery. It seems very odd, doesn't it, that one could achieve freedom through such a thing as slavery. But that's exactly what Paul the Apostle proposes to the Corinthians in chapters 9 and 10 of his letter. An interesting concept, a very Christian concept. Now you have to understand that in the first century in Greece, and the city of Corinth of course was in Greece and Paul was writing to that particular church in that city, you have to understand that in first century Greece it was quite an advantage to be a free person in a society largely inhabited by those who were slaves. Today, you, know, you say you're free. If you're not in jail, you know, you're free. But in those days, being free was a really a, a, a personal, um, a personal uh, uh, um, advantage that you enjoyed that not everybody enjoyed in your, uh, in your society. So this condition, it seems, had led them to feel proud and forget that freedom brought with it certain responsibilities. So there were people in the church at Corinth, because they were free, because they were free men, uh, thought that this was something to be proud of. And in the church at Corinth, where there were both slaves and free men who gathered together to worship, this caused some division. So in his letter, Paul the apostle reminds them of the four areas that he himself, as an apostle, had given up, where he had given up his freedom in order to guarantee the salvation of other people. An example which he hopes will temper their pride. Too proud, they were free, they thought they were better than everyone else, especially better than those who were slaves and who were also worshiping in that congregation. And so he tells them 
how he has given up certain freedoms in order to guarantee the salvation. So those are the things we're going to talk about in chapters 9 and 10, the four freedoms that he gave up. First of all, first freedom that he's given up is the freedom to be compensated for preaching. The freedom that he's given up to be paid, if you wish, for uh, preaching. And let's go to chapter 9, we'll read uh, uh, the passage here is a little bit long, but it explains well what he's talking about here. He says, and read with me, chapter 9, verse 1, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we not have a right to eat and drink? Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or do only Barnabas and I not have a right to refrain from working? Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? Or who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? I am not speaking these things according to human judgment, am I? Or does not the law also say these things? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. God is not concerned about oxen, is he? Or is he speaking altogether for our sake? Yes, for our sake it was written because the plowman ought to plow in hope and the thresher to thresh in hope of sharing the crops. If we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we should reap material things from you? If others share the right over you, do we not more? Nevertheless, we did not use this right, but we endure all things that we may cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple, and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share with the altar? And so we'll stop, we'll stop there, he goes on, but that's enough to make my point. Paul says, one of the freedoms that I've given up is the freedom to be compensated for preaching. He claims that he is a legitimate apostle because he has seen the Lord and established them in Christ through his preaching. So, you know, I have a legitimacy. I am an apostle, he says, and I have a right uh, over you because I taught you the gospel. You're, you're the fruit of my labor, he says. And then he points to the other apostles and he reminds them that they travel with their wives. He even mentions Peter. You know? Peter and the other apostle, he says, they travel with their wives. He says, don't I have the same right? And it makes me, it makes me think here. He says, Peter and the brothers of the Lord. Doesn't that make Jesus, Jesus had like sister-in-laws, nieces and nephews? Because right here, Paul says, you know, he mentions the apostles, and then the brothers of the Lord who travel with their wives. Just a little interesting thing when you think about it. Paul also reviews the scriptures that teach the principle that the one who works at something deserves to profit or to be paid by that enterprise. I mean, if you work at something, you ought to be paid, he says. So after establishing his right to receive payment for his work, according to the example of the other apostles, according to the teachings of the scriptures, according to the history of the Jewish priesthood, he declares that he has given up that right in order to maintain a higher principle. And he talks about that in verse 14. Read with me, he says, so also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. So he kind of summarizes the point here. He summarizes the freedom and the right that he has been given by the Lord himself to be paid for what he does. He says, you know, I, I'm an apostle. I preach the gospel to you. You're Christians because of my work. I have a right to be paid for what I do. But then let's read verse 15 and see how he follows up with that idea. He says, but I have used none of these things and I am not writing these things that it may be done so in my case. For it would be better for me to die than have any man make my boast an empty one. So now he claims that he says this, 
not to get them to pay him what he has a right to. You know, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty, he says, so that you'll pay me a salary. That's not the reason why I'm saying this. He says he'd rather die than to have someone accuse him of preaching for money. I mean, he has a right to be paid for his work, but he says, I don't want anybody to say that I'm preaching just to make money. So he goes on now with his argument in verse 16, 17, 18, he says the following. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this voluntarily, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have a stewardship entrusted to me. What then is my reward? That when I preach the gospel, I may offer the gospel without charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. And so he explains why he preaches for free. He preaches for free in order to do two things. One, to demonstrate that his preaching is a responsibility given to him by God. It's a, it's a thing that he does whether he gets money for it or not because God has directed him to do it. If you pay him to do it, he'll do it. If you don't pay him to do it, He'll do it the same. You know, an example of that is people who are artists, for example, you know, they have a vision and they, they're artists and they want to paint and whatever. If they sell their paintings, great. If they don't sell their paintings, they just keep painting, don't they? They have a vision, they have a talent, they have something that pushes them to express themselves. Well, Paul is saying kind of the same thing. God has given me this thing to do. And whether I get paid or not, I've got to do this thing. I've got to preach. And then secondly, he says, by giving up his right to be paid, he can freely offer the gospel to everybody, not just those who can afford it. Not just rich churches or rich people can hear the gospel, who can afford to exchange you know, his ministry for money, but poor people can do it. All kinds of people can hear him preach the gospel. So Paul is free to receive payment but he gives up this freedom in order to gain the freedom to preach to everyone who will listen without reference to money. I mean, they, they can accuse him of a lot of things. Oh, you're preaching you're the gospel out of pride or, or you're some kind of religious wacko or whatever. But they can't say, oh, you're doing this just for the money. He takes away that, that accusation. That's why he gives up his freedom to be paid. And you know, we, we accomplish, we do the same thing here in Chakta, don't we? We provide support for Jean Almira, who works in Haiti. And why do we do this? So he can preach the gospel to the people of Haiti for free. They don't have to pay him. The church there doesn't have to, it's a very poor country. And we know, you, know, you think we have problems because it rained a little bit and maybe we got some water in our basement or something. I mean, in Haiti, when it rains, wow, it's terrible. So the people of that nation can't accuse our missionary of preaching the gospel to them for money. Because he goes anywhere on the island of Haiti, in any town, any city, any village, any church, any place, and he can bring the good news to those people and not ask for anything in return. Why? Because we and other churches here in the United States provide money so that Jean can do his work in Haiti at no charge to the people of that country. So this is what Paul is trying to accomplish so that his sincerity and his goodwill would not be in question. Another freedom that Paul gave up is the freedom from tradition and the freedom from opinion. Keep going, verse 19, we're in chapter nine if you're following along in your Bibles. He says the following, he says, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews, I became a Jew, that I might win Jews, to those who are under the law as under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. 
I have become all things to all men that I may by all means save some. And I do all things for the sake of the gospel that I may become a fellow partaker in it. So Paul is saying as a Christian, he had only one Lord. And so because of that, he was free from the demands of religion. He was free from the demands of culture, tradition, and other people's opinions. As a Christian, he says, his only Lord was Jesus. His only law, the word of Christ. He, was, he, he wasn't without any direction, any you know, uh, box, any uh, uh, rules. Uh, he says, I'm under Christ. I'm under the word of Christ. And that's a higher rule than any other rule, somebody's opinion, for example. So as he traveled, he gave up this freedom, this freedom to be you know, not under anybody's opinion or tradition, only under Christ. He gave up this, this freedom and he subjected himself to other people's religion, for example. I mean, he preached in synagogues, Acts 18. He preached in Greek schools. So he didn't limit himself only to synagogues. You know, he, he went everywhere to bring the gospel. He didn't limit himself. A Jew would not go into a Greek school to preach. So you know, he, he, he was able to go everywhere. He says he, he subjected himself to tradition. We know in Acts chapter 21, for example, that he took vows in order to placate the Jews and he went to the temple. He didn't have to take vows. We know that story. The leaders of the church said, you know, a lot of people are saying that you're against Moses and you're teaching against Moses. A lot of the Jews are feeling you're against their religion. And they advised him to take vows and to bring someone to go to the temple to demonstrate that he wasn't against Moses. He didn't have to do that. He wasn't under compulsion from a religious point of view to do that thing, but he did it. He did it in order not to offend that group of people. Um, he, he subjected himself to other people's culture. I mean, he took Timothy, who was the son of a, a, a Greek man, and had him circumcised to avoid controversy. Did he have to, you know, did Timothy have to be circumcised? No, of course not, he didn't have to. But in order to be able to move in, in the Jewish you know, culture, to be able to teach, he subjected himself and his assistant, if you wish, to that culture's demands. He didn't have to do these things. They were all uh, concessions to other people's beliefs, other people's traditions, other people's particular weaknesses, not his own. He did them so that he might have access to them and preach the gospel to those people who because of cultural or religious or personal barriers would not hear the message of Jesus otherwise. He didn't have to go to the synagogue on Saturdays. He didn't have to do that. But he went. Why? Because he knew the Jews would be there and he'd have access to them in order to preach to them and, and, and teach them. You know, we don't always feel comfortable with other people's views or religious traditions, but like Paul, it's sometimes necessary to, to set aside our discomfort and our judgment in order to have an opportunity to share our faith with them. And I remember once uh, Lisa and I, uh, there was a, an individual that we knew and you know, we were trying to share our faith with them and, and they were Jewish. And they asked us if we wanted to go to you know, the synagogue with them just to experience that. Sure, we went. Did we have to go? Of course not. Did we have to you know, uh, 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 submit ourselves to the traditions and the rules that go on if you go to a, a synagogue on a Friday night? Well, of course. And it was quite an eye-opening experience as well. But we subjected ourselves to that to maintain that relationship so that we could have the opportunity to share Christ with that, with that person. A third thing that uh, Paul uh, talks about is freedom from the demands of the law. Now we're not going to read this too long, chapter 9, verse 24, all the way to chapter 10, but in that long passage from 9 to 10, Paul explains that he's free from the demands of the law and now he's under grace. This means that he is now saved by a system of grace rather than a system of law. And I, maybe we need to explain this. A person can be saved, meaning 
avoid condemnation from God. A, a person can be saved by the law if that person obeys the law perfectly. Because perfect obedience equals salvation and eternal life. If you obey the law of God, in other words, everything in the Old Testament, right? If you obey the law of God and never break any of the commandments, then you'll be saved. You, you can go to heaven. As a matter of fact, Jesus was raised from the dead because He managed to be righteous according to the law. Jesus was not saved by grace. The resurrection of Jesus was not accomplished because of grace. The resurrection of Jesus was accomplished because He obeyed the law perfectly. 1 Peter 2 verse 22 says, Jesus who committed no sin nor was any deceit found in His mouth. He never did anything wrong. He never said anything wrong. So because of that, death could not hold Him. So He was, he was literally saved from death because He lived a perfect life. Now our problem is that, well, we're just not able to obtain salvation in this way. Even if we understand the principle, we're not able to accomplish it. We always sin, Romans 3.23, all have sinned, all have sinned, everybody has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we cannot be saved by the law because we can't, we can't obey it. Even if we know what the rules are, we can't keep them. Not consistently anyways. So what happens? God devises a plan to save us despite our weaknesses. He sends Jesus to obtain salvation according to the law on our behalf by living a perfect life and then offering that perfect life on the cross and then resurrecting from the dead to prove that God has accepted His life in exchange for our life. And then God offers us salvation based on a system of faith in Jesus rather than salvation based on perfect obedience. By the way, if you're wondering, what's the good news of the gospel? The good news is God offers us salvation, eternal life, resurrection, based on a system of believing rather than on a system of perfect obedience. That's the good news. That's the news that we go, whew. <laughs> right? Aren't we happy about that? Whoa! Am I ever glad I'm going to be judged because I believe in the Lord Jesus rather than how good I've been or how much I've been able to achieve as far as perfection is concerned. I don't know about you, but for me that's good news because when I look back on my life, it's pretty spotty. More spots than white, let's put it that way. Now, you'd think, you'd think that a guy who didn't have to be perfect would let things slide, right? But Paul says exactly the opposite. In chapter nine, verse, uh, scoot down to verse 27. He says, he says, but I buffet my body. Buffet means I, I get it into control. He says, but I buffet my body and I make it my slave, lest possibly after I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. So what he has been given for free is so precious that he works extra hard to preserve it in case he would, through carelessness, lose it. So yes, I'm saved by a system of faith and I respond. How do I respond to God? Well, I, I confess that I believe Christ and I repent of my sins and I'm baptized. That's my response of faith. That's how I say to God, I believe. And Paul, who's done this, Paul, who's repented of his sins, we know that Paul was uh, baptized. But he doesn't just leave it at that. He says, I get my body under control. So in chapter 10, he uses the Israelites as an example of those who received great blessings, great opportunities, but they grew careless and consequently they lost their way. In the case of the Corinthians, now you're wondering, what does all this have to do with you know, the Corinthians? Well, I'm getting to that. In the case of the Corinthians, he warns them to be careful that their freedom not lull them into complacency with the world. Yes, I've been saved by a system of faith. Yes, I've responded by repentance and obedience and baptism. I've done that, but I continue each day 
to make a witness of my faith. How? By pursuing obedience to Christ. So Paul is free from the perfect demands of the law because of grace, but he becomes a slave to personal holiness and self-control and purity so that sin will not take root in his life again and spoil his salvation and of course the salvation of other people. How many times have we seen that? Many times, you know, we read about it in the paper, so on and so forth. It's always a scandal. Uh, a minister somewhere you know, runs off with the secretary, abandons his wife and runs off with the secretary. I, I shouldn't say secretary, that's a terrible thing, but you know, has some sort of public failing like that. And that, you know, he's not any better than any other man. You know, other men do those type of things. But when it's a minister, it's newsworthy. Let's put it this way. You know, the, the, the newspapers love to report that. Well, the damage there is not only to this man, of course, and to the person that he is gone off with, but also to his family, her family, so on and so forth, but it also affects the church. I've seen churches go through terrible trauma because they trusted this person. They looked up to this person. They had confidence in this person as a spiritual leader, and that person let them down, and a lot of times they become discouraged themselves. And so Peter here is, uh, excuse me, Peter, Paul here is saying, I, I take special care to get myself under control so that I don't you know, fall away, lose my soul, and in doing that, lose the soul of others. I've given up the freedom to be relaxed about my salvation. I work at it every day. And then number four, he says, the final area where Paul gives up his freedom is freedom to do what his conscience permits. Verses 23, man, we have to rush now. This idea is summarized in two places, chapter 10, verses 23 and 24. So freedom to do what his conscience permits. Chapter 10, 23, he says, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. Then I want you to skip down to verse 32. He repeats the idea again. He says, give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, that they may be saved. So Paul was intelligent, he was well-traveled, he was well-educated, he was mature in the faith. He knew right from wrong. He could discern the gray areas. If he permitted himself something, he did it with a clear conscience. But in this passage he says that he is free to do what his conscience permits, but not at the expense of somebody else's conscience. It's a tricky area, we talked about that last week. And so the boundary that Paul sets for his conduct has four sides. Side number one, that his conduct did not offend or go against God and His word. I mean, that's pretty easy, isn't it? What I do, what I permit myself, will not violate God's word. It's a good way of deciding if I should do something or not. The second boundary that he set is that it did not go against his own conscience. You know, even if the Bible says I can do it, if in my mind I feel guilty about doing it, it's always better not to do it. So that was the second boundary of what he would do. The third boundary that he put was that it did not go against the conscience of unbelievers. And then the fourth boundary, that it did not offend the church. So he placed restrictions. He had freedom to do what he wanted with the things that were permissible, but he didn't permit himself anything, or rather I should say, he didn't permit himself just any old thing. He had a way of deciding what he would do. He was free to say and do many things because of his superior knowledge and experience, but he restricted himself according to the knowledge and the experience of other people. That's a mature idea. Their conscience and their limit was his limit. This was not fair, was it? I mean, it's not fair. Why should I limit myself something that I know I'm able to do because this other person feels kind of bad about it? So it wasn't fair and it wasn't easy, but it was definitely Christ-like. It was definitely Christ-like. What did Paul say in Philippians chapter 2 verse 6 about Jesus? 
Jesus, who although He existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but He emptied Himself, taking the form of a bondservant. Talk about restriction. I mean, Jesus, who is the Son of God, who is divine, restricts Himself to be in the body, in the form of a human being. You talk about restrictions. 33 years of, res he restricts himself to time. Here's God who lives outside of time, who restricts himself to time. So Paul was free to say and do as he pleased, but he gave up that freedom so he could say and do as God pleased for the sake of other people. So, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and 10, Paul says that he has basically given up four freedoms that he has as a Christian. Number one, the freedom to be paid for his work. He was free to receive a salary for his work, but he didn't take it because he wanted to be able to preach for free. He didn't want anybody to say, oh, you're just doing this for the money. Number two, the freedom from tradition and opinions. He was under Christ. He was not under anybody's tradition or anybody's opinion, but he gave up that freedom and subjected himself to other people's traditions and opinions in order to have access to them and be able to preach the gospel to them. Thirdly, the freedom from the demands of the law. And finally, freedom to follow his conscience. In other words, he subjected himself to the rules of the law, always again to be able to reach others who are under the law. And freedom from, uh, to follow his conscience. He restricted himself so that he wouldn't go past somebody else's conscience and thus uh, offend them. Now each of these are very precious personal freedoms that he has willingly given up, but he's done it for two reasons. First of all, so he can have the opportunity to preach the gospel to as many people as possible. I mean, if somebody invited me to go preach the gospel and they were a group of people and they believed that when you had to worship, you had to take off your shoes and put on a hat, and they invited me to go preach to them. Do I have to take off my shoes and do I have to put on a hat in order to teach the Bible? Of course not. I mean, you show me where it says that anywhere in the Bible, of course not. But if those people invited me to go to their place, wherever it was, in order to teach them the Bible, then I would take off my shoes and I would put on a hat in order to go and have access to them. Now that's a small example, but that's what uh, Paul is talking about here. And secondly, uh, actually missionaries do that all the time, don't they? Especially in developing countries and so on and so forth, or places where they have primitive civilizations. I mean, they, they start living like the people in order to have access to those people. They don't have to do it. I remember one missionary once, uh, Bill Bonner was his name. He was in Africa and he was, uh, he was invited, uh, it was a village and there was a, they still have a chief system there in that particular part of the country and he went to uh, the village and the, they sat down and they, they served food. He didn't know what it was, but you know, the Bible says if they put it in front of you, just eat it. You know? So he's eating it and he's going, you know, and the chief says you know, in, in that language, you like? You know, ah, it's okay, you know, it tastes like chicken, I guess, you know, whatever. And so Bill says, so what is it? He said, rat. And I remember asking Bill, did you keep on eating? He went, no, I kind of pushed it around the plate for a while. <laughs> but you know, I mean, he did what he had to because he wanted access to that chief to be able to share with him the good news. And very quickly, uh, we've got three minutes left here. Uh, he did it also so that nothing he says or nothing that he would do would become a reason why somebody else would lose their soul. Nobody could say, I quit the church, or I stopped following Jesus because of what Paul did. So he limited his activities so that no one else could stumble. So he became a slave of other people's customs and weaknesses and cultures so he could freely offer the gospel and be freed from any blame for someone else. Now this material gives us insight into Paul's motives and methods of working with people, but what are the lessons for us today? Two main ones and then we quit, okay? Lesson number one, everybody's soul is important, not just yours. You know, we tend to circle the wagons when we're safe, but this is not God's way. 
God wants every soul to hear the gospel and the thing most important next to your own soul's salvation should be the salvation of somebody else's soul. Remember that when you have a chance to confess Christ, when we ask you to invite people to church, when we take up special collections for mission works, souls, it's all about preaching the gospel so that people will have the same salvation and confidence that you have in Christ. And then number two, the boundary of our freedom is love. We need to remember that the guiding principle in our dealings with other people, whether they be Christians or not, is always love, not freedom. It's not about what I'm free to do or not do, it's about what would love do in a certain situation. You see, in Christ we're always free to love and many times the greater the restriction that's placed on us, the greater love that God requires from us. Try to see it that way when your movements and your language or whatever is restricted because of someone else's conscience. Don't see that as a restriction, see it as an opportunity to express your love in Christ for that person. Okay, well that's our lesson for this morning. We'll be dismissed now. Thank you for your attention. We'll see you next week. <laughs>